Well, amen, and again, good morning. Uh, welcome to King's Cross. If you've come in just the last few minutes, uh, we welcome you, glad that you're here. My name is Clint, uh, one of the elders of this church. Get to serve and do lots of the preaching and teaching, uh, though not all of it, even as you were blessed, if you were here last week from Pastor Hez and the good word uh, from him. And so again, welcome, glad that you're here. Even as Christians, it's sometimes easy to forget that we are in the, ma- in the middle of spiritual warfare at all times. It's easy to forget Ephesians 6, 12, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. As a pastor, I know this is always a reality, but there are moments in life and in ministry in particular where I'm more keenly aware of it. The last few weeks, there have been tons of those moments. Conversations with people suffering Clear suffering that's attacks or the result of attacks from the evil one. Conversations I'm not looking for and just happen to bump into. Conversations with people who are loved ones, beloved members, even the death of our brother Timothy. So my question is, what do we need in the midst of spiritual warfare? Amid spiritual warfare, what is it that we need? We need reminding of the God who knows us who has revealed himself to us and who is indeed with us. We need to know that he knows. Indeed, we need transforming encounters with the living God, the one true God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who came to us in the person and work of his son, the Lord Jesus. And we need to know that by the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, the people of God. We need to know God's love. We need to know his word. We need to worship. We need to worship corporately. We need to worship individually, privately. We need to pray. We need to seek his face. We need to cry out to him. We need to trust him, to love him, and to serve him, and to love and serve one another. We need God. We need God as he's revealed himself in his word. Today is a great day for an an encounter with the living God. Today is a great day as we come to a magnanimous text of Scripture where he pulls back the curtain and reveals something of who he is. And as he reveals who he is, demonstrates how he loves to work through flawed people, uh, imperfect people, to accomplish his perfect purposes in a broken world. If you want to title this morning, The Great I Am is with us. The Great I Am is with us. Let's pray one more time and ask for his help. Great God, I come trembling before the Everest that is this passage. In and of myself, I'm utterly inadequate to do anything faithful with this word. And yet, even as you teach us in this word, our adequacy is not necessary. Yours is. And so even as you promised to Moses, would you be with me as I teach? Would you help me by your spirit to be faithful to your word and to communicate and to teach faithfully to these, your people? Would you give us hearts to hear? Give us a tenderness. Give us an awareness that we are indeed in the middle of spiritual warfare at all times, whether we know it or not. And what we need is you and what we have is you. You are with us. Help us to know you, God. Help us to know you, God. Help us to encounter you, God. Help us to know your nearness, God. Holy Spirit, help us, we pray, for the great glory of your name among all generations. Amen. Give you context and just to summarize, um, it's really important that you get a number of things going on. So the first two chapters of Exodus span some 400 plus years. So we covered a lot of ground in just a couple of chapters. Joseph and his his family settled in Egypt and at at the time were in great privilege. But then suddenly the Pharaoh dies, a new Pharaoh comes to power. That privilege is taken away and instead it's persecution. This new Pharaoh is insecure. He's worried about the people of God, Israel, among them. These sojourners are multiplying and they're growing so fast and so rapidly. He's worried, hey, this is going to threaten my political power. And so he enslaves them and he puts them to ruthless labor, bricks and straw, suffering under slavery and and ruthless labor. They continue to multiply and grow. So as the more he persecutes, the more God says, I'm still going to fulfill my promises to my people. They continue to multiply and grow. And so then he grabs Shifra and Pua, two Hebrew midwives, and he says, hey, I want you to kill all the boys born to the Hebrew women. 
Because I don't want them to raise up and become an army that might side with my political allies and come against me and attack me. So I want you to kill them. Well, they feared the Lord more than they feared Pharaoh. They did not do that. So he leveled up his persecution and now tells everybody in Egypt, hey, any Hebrew boy that is born, throw him into the Nile. Infanticide, kill them all. Any Hebrew boy, make him, make him die. Yet Moses' parents, his mother and father, she gives birth to Moses. They come up with a plan of faith to build an ark, a little basket, put him in the Nile. And in God's providence, Moses floats and ends up at Pharaoh's daughter's house. She finds him, feels compassion on him. And his sister is kind of low-key, uh, sneaks up and says, hey, you may go find a Hebrew uh, mother to nurse this baby for you. Takes Moses to his own mom. She gets to nurse him and raise him. And that day, probably up to about four years old. And he raised, then, he, then he comes back to Pharaoh's house. And he, as he comes to Pharaoh's house, he's raised in Pharaoh's house with great privilege. He's basically a prince in Egypt. But then when he turned 40 years old, he decides, I want to go to my people. I want to go out to my people. I'm concerned about the burdens and their slavery, and I want to go to them. Well, he goes out, and he sees a, an Egyptian taskmaster beating one of his Hebrew brothers, saves this Hebrew brother, kills the taskmaster, buries him in the sand. The next day comes up on two Hebrews who are arguing with each other, thinking, I'm the hero. I'm the deliverer. I just saved one dude yesterday. And even if it's one at a time, I'm going to set our people free. He shows up, tries to manage this conflict. They say, what are you going to do, kill us like you did the Egyptian yesterday? And he knows at that moment, I'm known. My people don't respect me. They don't want to follow me. He jumps the gun. He's jumped in front of God's plans, and then he's sent away into Midian into this desert for 40 years. God, in his kindness, gives him a wife and children. And this is where we pick up. As we closed last time, though, as Moses is doing this, and now he's in the desert. Remember, if you look up just to chapter 2, verse 23, what is Israel doing? During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham with Isaac and with Jacob, God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Now, chapter 3 and chapter 4 pump the brakes, and we slow way down. 400-plus years and stuff happening rapidly, now we slow down. And what we do is we pull up a chair, and we sit in on this conversation that Moses has with the God of the universe. And as we pull up this chair, and as we listen in to this conversation that Moses has with the God of the universe, I want to highlight four primary attributes of God and our appropriate responses to those attributes. Now, there's going to be a lot more than just four attributes we're going to talk about and a lot more appropriate responses. There's so much more here than I could possibly cover. I could preach this text at least ten times and not scratch the surface. But I at least want to point out four and four appropriate responses Attribute number one and response number one, God is holy, we should tremble. God is holy, we should tremble. Look again at verse, chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. Why is this bush not burned? When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here, here am I. Now, first, I just want to highlight something. God's call is sometimes surprising. <laughs> Moses, at this point, has just been shepherding for 40 years. And we talked about e Egypt looked down on shepherds as the lowest class of all citizens. He went from a priest in Egypt so he's just a shepherd boy shepherding his father-in-law's sheep, right? So he's shepherding. He's just doing this common work. He's living this ordinary, if not lowly life, and he's going out on an ordinary day. <laughs> he's just doing ordinary work. He goes out to the west side of Horeb, not west side of the, so don't get too excited, Jonathan. Jonathan, get real excited. We start talking about west side. East side is better. Anyway, but he goes out to the west side uh, of, of the desert, to the mountain of Horeb, which is also the Mount, uh, Mount Sinai. We'll see that later. We'll find out and, and see him worship there later. We'll see a promise of God even later. But he goes out and he's just having a normal day doing normal work. He's got his head down. Forty years of just faithful, ordinary labor, ordinary work. Forty years of ordinary work before God calls him to an extraordinary work of being Israel's deliverer. Now, again, remember he'd already shot his shot at being Israel's deliverer and failed. He'd been driven into the wilderness. I would assume he's given up on doing anything great for God. 
He, I would assume Moses is like, nah, the rest of my life is shepherding sheep. I messed up. I had an opportunity. I messed it up. Ah, me and sheep, that's where we're at. <laughs> and so I would assume he's just kind of, he, he's, he's forgotten even the thought and the dream. Forty years, four decades of shepherding. I assume he's forgotten, what if I was the deliverer? What if my people could get free? But he was faithfully serving in the task God had given to him. Now Moses, in this moment, is a great illustration of what the Bible teaches. That God humbles the proud and exalts the lowly. That, that God looks for those who are being faithful with little and then entrusts them with much. Even as A.W. Tozer once noted that it is doubtful that God can use anyone greatly until he's hurt him deeply. So Moses has been hurt. He's been humbled. He's low now. He understands himself as a low, like second, third, fourth, fifth class citizen. And, and he's, he's humble and he's just doing his work. He's just being faithful, doing his humble work. God's best servants in great works are those who were first his best servants in ordinary work. He sometimes calls people to extraordinary work when we least expect it. And therefore, brothers and sisters, Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men. It might be in the middle of ordinary work that God does call you to do something extraordinary. <laughs> and so keep your head down, keep being faithful, keep doing whatever you're doing, do unto the glory of God. But also notice God's call is personal. He calls Moses by name. Moses, Moses. Now again, like, like we're super modern people, so there's all kinds of like challenges with even imagining this. But I want you to try to imagine this. I mean, it's true. It happened. It's just our problem with imagining it. <laughs> like I just want you to imagine like I'm just doing ordinary work and then a bush calls out my name. <laughs> it's like, who just said my name? Like what is happening right now? Moses, Moses. But friends, if you're in Christ, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of God, God called you by name. He knows your name. And he called you in some circumstance that you were not anticipating probably, he called you. Or you were doing something you had done before and suddenly the voice of God gripped you and grabbed you and called you. Well, let's talk about that burning bush for just a minute and what we learn from our great God in this theophany. Now, theophany is what uh, theologians call an appearance of the invisible God. It makes himself visible in the Old Testament in a certain manner. Now, you might have noticed in verse 2 that it says the angel of the Lord was in the bush. But then if you'll notice down the rest of the conversation, it's just the Lord speaks. God speaks. So this angel of the Lord is the Lord's presence, is the Lord's appearance. So this, again, is what, what's called a theophany. It's the invisible God appearing, in this case, in a fire in a bush. Now, fire's significance, this is not random that God would show up as a fire in a bush. Fire is a consistent, common display of God's holy and powerful presence. He will appear as a pillar of fire and lead Israel later. He will appear uh, in, as fire at Mount Sinai in the tabernacle, and centuries later, even fire signals his presence even at Pentecost. Fire is a symbol and picture of God's powerful holiness. And what a good symbol and metaphor and picture that it is. Fire is beautiful to look at, warm to stand beside. But if you get too close, it can damage you in ways you can never recover from. It's a beautiful picture. In fact, God warns Israel later about the dangers of idolatry when he says in Deuteronomy 4.24, the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. This God, this God calls out to Moses from the burning bush, and this clearly is communicating God's holiness. He's a consuming fire, but he's not consuming the bush. <laughs> he's got enough power to overthrow the rules of nature. In two different ways you see in this metaphor, in this, in this manifestation of his presence. One, it's a fire in a bush. Bur bushes burn easily. The bush is not burning. Overthrow of nature. Number two, a fire in order to burn needs fuel. Not this fire. This fire burns without fuel. He is his own fuel. He needs nothing else to feed himself to exist like a fire does. So he's overthrowing, demonstrating, overthrowing nature in these ways that the bush is not consumed. Ordinarily it would be. And the fire has no fuel. Ordinarily it would have fuel. God's powerful holiness is sustained by God's powerful holiness. He needs no fuel to sustain his holiness. He needs no power, no help, no assistance, no, nobody else helping him sustain himself. He is. We'll talk about that more later. 
But for now, this conversation between God and Moses, again, teaches us that God is holy and we must approach him as such. Look at verse 5. Then God said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place in which you are standing is holy ground. Now, taking your sandals off your feet is still a common practice in Eastern culture. It's a display of humility and of reverence and even of intimacy, of communion. So this is a common practice, and in, in this moment, I would just imagine that, that Moses, as he struck and he hears this raging fire in this bush, not consuming it, say, God, you're standing on holy ground. I would imagine his toes grip the soil, and he's reminded of Genesis 2-7. I was formed out of that soil. He's reminded of Genesis 3, uh, 19, I believe it is. I'll end up back in that soil. Like, there's an immediate humility. I'm in the presence of holiness. I'm in the presence of God. And he just told me, don't get too close. You'll get burned up. You better be careful how you approach me. (laughs) Take your sandals off. Understand whose presence you are in. He is holy. He is righteous in every way. He is flawless. He is perfect in his essence. Friends, God's holiness is like the sun. And you're like a piece of notebook paper soaked in the gasoline of your sin. You best be careful how close you get to a holy God. He's not like any of the so-called gods uh, in Moses, polytheistic, that is, many gods, pantheistic, that is, the universe is divine, or syncretistic, mix all of that up, culture. (laughs) He's not like any of those gods. And he's letting you know I'm not like those gods. You don't come to me and say, oh, I'll take this from that God, this from that God. Oh, and nature is divine too. And if that blesses the womb, okay, great, I'll take take all of these things from, he's like, you don't understand who you're dealing with right now. Take the sandals off your feet and understand the danger of this moment. He is the powerful God, the holy God, the one true God, Elohim. His presence provokes fear. Verse 6, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. You better be careful how you approach God. But praise God, he's faithful. He keeps his promises. He says, Moses, Moses, easy. But I'm the God of your father, Moses. Remember your mom and dad? That my providence led them to the plan to sustain your life. That's the reason you exist. And remember their God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? I'm that God. That's who's speaking to you. That's the conversation you're having right now. Moses, this is the God of the fathers talking to him from the bush, the Holy One of Israel. So, friends, just a couple of takeaways right here. You cannot approach God any kind of way. That's one of the problems with our culture. I think just naturally and instinctively, we've got dumb T-shirts like, Jesus is my homeboy. (laughs) I'm going to talk a little bit. It is silly. It's silly. Like, God is holy. Now, again, God makes himself our friend. He brings us into his family, but he's holy. He doesn't cease to be holy just because he's merciful. He is merciful. He is kind. He is gentle. He is compassionate. He is loving, but he is holy. And we should tremble. You want to see how holy God is? Tell you some other feet to look at. at The feet of Christ on the cross with nails through them. God's holiness hates Sin. God is holy. We should tremble. But just again so you don't misunderstand, he's not only holy, he's also kind and compassionate and faithful. That's what we see in the next part of the conversation. Secondly, God is faithful. We should pray. God is faithful. We should pray. Often in suffering, It can feel like God is nowhere to be found. So in these moments, he meets with us, he transforms us, he comforts us. But there are moments in life when you're suffering and it feels like, God, where are you? Where are you? Are you like, are you here? Do you know what I'm going through? Do you feel my pain? Do you you see? Like there are those moments. And sometimes I think Christians can try to be all pious. Like, no, I I never have those moments. Well, the Holy Spirit inspired psalmists to tell us about those moments. So I I think these moments exist for godly people. Psalm 13, verse 1, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? 
How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Psalm 44, verse 23. Awake! Why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly clings to the ground. Surely these are the kinds of prayers the people of uh, Israel were praying in the midst of Egypt. God, do you hear us? Do you see us? Our baby boys have been slaughtered. We've been in this oppression, 400 years of suffering. God, do you hear? Do you see? Are you there? Four generations have come and gone. Will this hellish experience ever end? Now that God has Moses' humble attention and understanding that he's on holy ground, he pulls the curtain back a little bit further and displays his watchful eye, his listening ear, his knowing mind, and his condescending compassion for his suffering people. Verse 7, Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And now behold, the cry, skip down to verse 9. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. And I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Friends, God sees every nanosecond of suffering. He hears every desperate prayer. His knowledge plums to the deepest depth of all of your pain. He is not blind to any injustice. He is not deaf to the mourner's prayer. He is not ignorant of your pain. God knows. And friends, he is always near. He always sees. He always hears. He always knows. He's uniquely near, especially in your suffering, Psalm 46.1. There's a unique nearness when you're going through it that God says, no, 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 I'm there. You may be asking how long or you've abandoned me. Have you forgotten me? He's like, I'm nearer than you've ever experienced my nearness. I am there. And not only that, He's moving. He's acting. I want you to know, some of, again, Jonathan was talking about some of the sweetest times of my communion with God in Christ by His Spirit has been in the worst suffering of my life. Those moments when you cry out to God like, God, I can't take another step. Like literally, I can't take another step. And He picks you up and He carries you and you look back later and you realize, I couldn't take another step, but He picked me up and He kept carrying me anyway. I love the song we just sang. I won't be going under. Is it ain't my strength I'm banking on. <laughs> His strength is carrying, and this is what we see, that God is near and that he acts. Look at verse 8. So he didn't just hear, see, know. He acts. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Notice he is compassionate unto condescension. He is so compassionate that he stoops super low for the suffering center. He says, I'm high and lofty, but I'm coming down to you lowly sinners. I'm high and exalted. I am holy. Be careful how you approach me, but I'm so good and kind and compassionate, I'm approaching you and your suffering. I'm coming to you. He comes down. He stoops low to save suffering sinners. He's a deliverer for his people. And notice he delivers from and to. He says, I will deliver you from bondage, from slavery, and I'm going to deliver you to a new land. And is this not every Christian's testimony? That our God condescends to us in Christ Jesus our Lord, delivers us from the bondage of our sin, and delivers us to the new land, relationship with God, but the new land, ultimately the promised land, the new heavens and the new earth. Philippians 2, 7 to 8, he, Christ emptied himself by taking the form of a servant stooping to the lowest possible, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. It might feel, beloved, like God is a million miles away and you're suffering, but he won't fail. He won't fail. He won't fail. We should sing that. <laughs> it's a good thing we sing it. That's a good thing to sing it. He won't fail. In Christ, he will deliver you to the promised land, no matter what suffering you're in the middle of. 
He is near. He sees. He hears your cries. He knows your suffering. He will act. And you know that the psalmist that we just quoted from, they knew this. So I quoted the intensity of their suffering and the things they were saying, but they also knew the truth that God is faithful to his promises. So let me read them to you again and then go where and end where they end. Psalm 13 again. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel of my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Skip down to verse 5. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. Hesed, said, your faithfulness. I have trust, trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. What about the psalmist in Psalm 44? Awake, why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? For our souls bow down to the dust. Our belly clings to the ground. Rise up. Come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love, your covenant faithfulness, the, the reputation you have as a covenantly faithful God. Come, redeem us, save us with your steadfast love. So we can sing, rain came, wind blew, but my house was built on you. We can say and truly mean I'm safe with you. I'm going to make it through. I don't know if that means this suffering will end for me this side of glory. I just know glory is coming. Suffering will end then. <laughs> I'm going to make it through. I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Why? Because he's compassionate unto condescension. He's a deliverer of his people. From slavery to a new land, from bondage of sin to life with the Savior. Now, I wonder if at this point, if anybody in Israel was thinking this way, 400 years of suffering, I wonder if any of them remembered God's prophecy to Abraham in Genesis 15. Let me read it to you again and see why this would be relevant. Then the Lord said to Abraham, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for how long? For 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. I wonder if there's a few faithful Jews remembering the promises of God. Counting, wait a minute, it's been four generations. They would count a generation as 100 years. It's been four generations. It's been 400 years. And, and might be saying to one another, no, 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 brothers and sisters, it's been 400 years. Do you remember his word? Remember his word. Pray. Our God is going to act. Friends, you need to get you those kinds of friends. The kind of friends that say, remember his word. The kind of friends that say, we need to pray. You need those kind of friends. You ought to be that kind of friend. God, I know your word. God, I know your promises. God, I know you're good. I know your covenant faithfulness. I know you will come through. Brothers and sisters, let's remember his word and let's pray. Get and be that kind of church member. You know how we win spiritual warfare? We have church members who are committed to say, hey, let's, let's look at what the word says. Church members who say, brother, sister, let's take these burdens to the Lord in prayer and cry out to him. Get you some of those, what's that word say, friends. <laughs> Get you some of those, let's pray about it, friends, and keep them close. God is compassionate and faithful. We should pray. He will accomplish his perfect will, and he will do it through his people. His eyes are watching, his ears are listening, his mind knows, he knows exactly what to do, and he responds to the prayers of his people. So are you discouraged this morning? Are you suffering? Are you in a situation that feels impossible to get out of? Pray! Are you burdened with the brokenness of this world and how many people are dying and going to hell and have no interest in Christ? Pray! Are you experiencing demonic attacks and spiritual warfare? Pray, 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 pray. Why? Because God is faithful. God is faithful. Spurgeon says, I'm sure, brothers and sisters, there have been crises in history which have been entirely due to the prayers of God's people. There have been singular occurrences that the mere reader of history cannot understand, but there are many still alive who wait on God in prayer, and they make history. And then listen to this. More history is made in the prayer closet than in the national cabinet. Woo, talk to a Spurgeon. <laughs> More history is made in the prayer closet than in the White House. More history is made in the prayer closet than in politics or on Twitter or on Facebook or anywhere else. Pray. Uh, one application for this Sunday morning, every Sunday morning, we have a team of folks that come pray. Any and all are welcome. Nine o'clock before service, people are up in the rooms praying. I love this team. 
I love this happens. They're praying for missionaries. I'm getting texts all the time. Alex Herring and Eric Pruitt kind of overseeing, leading lots of it. Alex is sending me questions. She, she was asking me, hey, what, what's going on at this church? What's going on with that missionary partner? What's going on at this church? What can we pray? And I'm connecting them to these other missionary partners and other churches, and they're praying. And, and then my sister's at one of those churches. She's like, I love that. Our church should do that. I'm, I, I, want, I, want to do, I want our church to pray like that. Pray. Why? Because we're changing the world. <laughs> our God is faithful. We ought to pray. Go to that prayer meeting and change the world. God is holy. We should tremble. God is faithful. We should pray. Thirdly, God is with us. We should trust him. God is with us. We should trust him. So now that God has revealed his holiness and his compassionate faithfulness to act, he tells Moses the unique role that he's got to play in all of this. (laughs) Moses is going to be the deliverer. Verse 10, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people and the children of Israel out of Egypt. Moses' response reveals uh, that he's keenly aware of his inadequacies. (laughs) And I love this. I feel bad for my man at this point. But Moses said to God, "Uh, who, who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So I don't think we should read in this in an immediately rebellious posture on Moses. I think there was a humble, and rightly humble, posture because of his failures. Come like, hold up. <laughs> it ain't nothing but sheep back there. You talking to me? Like, you talking to me? Like, me, God? I'm going to go to Pharaoh? I'm going to tell him that I'm going to lead your people out of Egypt? Me? Like, God, do you know how this went the first time? <laughs> like, I went, I ended up killing a dude. Like, that wasn't good. Can't do that. <laughs> then, I, then I went to, to my people thinking, oh, I would be a hero at least to them because I assume they know. Like I, and they wouldn't even, I couldn't even resolve a conflict. <laughs> and I've been out here 40 years being a lowly shepherd. Am I supposed to just show, hey, fellas, I'm back. We're about to do this. <laughs> hey, Pharaoh. Hey, watch out. Let him go. Let him go. Let him go. Like, I I think there was a place where he's understanding, no, no, I don't have the resources to do this work. Like, I'm wondering if you're confused and, and, and like, I'm not, like, there is a sin in this. There is a question in God. There is an arrogance, but it's a, it's a broken, humble, uh, aware of himself, arrogance and and, and confusion of all of it. Say, are you sure? Are you sure? I don't think I have what it takes, God. Have you ever said that to God in prayer? I don't think I have what it takes, God. This begins uh, a series of but, 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 but that, that Moses does. So chapter 3, verse 11 right here, and then uh, verse, uh, I believe it's 14, and then chapter or 13, then chapter 4, verse 1, verse 10, and verse 13. We'll get, Lord willing, to those next week. And it is. It's kind of like that you tell your kid to do something. It's like, oh, but, 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 but. And that's, that's what Moses says. Like, time out. I, I hear what you're telling me to do, but I, I, got a few, I got a few questions we need to work out. But for now, I just want to remind you that our God is holy and faithful. He's pleased to do great work in and through flawed people. And it's actually the epitome of our flaws on display. When God calls us to do something great, and our first response is, I'm not adequate for the task. Of course you're not adequate. Who am I is the wrong question, Moses. <laughs> Who am I to do this? That's the wrong question. It reveals the human propensity to believe you are your best resource. That your knee-jerk response when God calls you to do something is, all right, do I have this in me? What, let me like immediately it's, you told me to do what now? Let me, see, let me see what I got. Like you turn away from him. This reveals our ignorance. It reveals the worst of us. <laughs> That our knee jerk would be, let me see if I think I got this. So God responds in verse 12. He said, but I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I've sent you when you've brought the people out of Egypt. You shall serve God on this mountain. God tells Moses, it's not who you are that will accomplish this victory. It's who I am. Friends, God has never never experienced an L. Throughout all eternity, he's never taken one loss. He's never lost a battle. He's never failed a test. He's the answer key. (laughs) Like he doesn't, like no one tests him. He's never been stumped. God has never not known what to do. He's never had a bad strategy. He's never made a bad decision. He's never been concerned about an outcome. He's never been panicked. He's never felt out of control. And he's never called the wrong person to accomplish what he wants them to accomplish through that person. Not one time. 
Not one time has he made a mistake on who he called to do what he called them to do. God is always victorious, always. The man or woman of God finds ultimate confidence not in our own resources or resume. Ultimately, we don't trust in our intellect. We don't trust in our theology. We don't trust in our relational ability. We don't trust in our wealth. We don't trust in our character, our strategy, our plans, our experiences, our gifts. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall. We rise and stand upright, Psalm 20, verse 7 to 8. It's not who we are that gives us confidence. It's who he is. As the prophet Isaiah promised and Jesus fulfilled, Emmanuel, God, with us. It's almost like I want you to imagine, you know, the movie Taken, Liam Neeson, and I don't want to get into too much of it, and if you haven't watched it, then, then don't watch it necessarily. Um, it's a, there's, a, there's a justice in the movie. I think the, the essence of the movie is a just cause. But there's a, there's a scene where he's kind of talking to a bad guy who's taking his daughter, and he lets the guy know, I have a particular set of skills <laughs> that's a nightmare for men like you. I just want you to imagine after the movie's over and daughter's back with dad, like how she walks around with dad after that. Now, you don't mess with my daddy. <laughs> like, he has a particular set of skills. <laughs> our confidence comes not from us, but from our Father. <laughs> our confidence comes because we know he has a particular set of skills. He wins every time, every time. So, uh, one Christian hip-hop artist says, My father's Liam Neeson, his children never get taken. So what I got to fear when I'm here with the rock of ages? What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? God chooses to use people, but he doesn't need us. The pressure's not on us. It's on him, and he's got it, so calm down. <laughs> he's with us. He wants, to rely on, he wants us to rely on his presence as our most powerful resource, not our own abilities, gifts, or strategies. And notice he said a sign of this, it's a future sign. He said, I'll be with you. This shall be the sign for you that I've sent for you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. you got to love it when God's like, I'm going to give you a sign, but it's in the future. <laughs> it's like, well, dang, I, I got something hard to do. I was kind of hoping to get a sign now. <laughs> He's like, no, no, you got to take me at my word. God is with us. He has promised. He's got us. He has promised to take us through. We must take him at his word. God is holy. We should tremble. God is faithful, we should pray. God is with us, we should trust him. And lastly, and impossibly in just a few minutes, but God is the great I am, we should worship his holy name. God is the great I am, we should worship his holy name. Look at verse 13. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what's his name? Like, what shall I say to them? So now he turns from, oh, snap, okay, it's not about me, my bad, I was tripping. <laughs> okay, okay, but when I go, and they look at me like, who are you? Like, are you really coming back? You, this is, you're the same dude? And they ask me what your name is, what should I say to him? Because I think in his heart at this moment, he's knowing, like, what am I telling him? I was talking to a bush? <laughs> like, I, 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 <laughs> like, I'm not confident they're just going to trust me on this one. It's been, a, it's been four decades, I didn't end well, I just, like, God, what's your name? <laughs> So I don't think it's just like I need you to identify yourself like I have no idea who you are. He's saying, no, no, no. How do I tell them that the real God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, the real God, the one true God, the God of Israel, how do I let them know you sent me to do this? What do I say to them if they ask me? And God gives them, him a threefold answer to the question. Look at verse 14, and, and you'll notice the, how often it says said, and so you'll, you'll see this threefold emphasis. God said to Moses, so he's, first he says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Verse 15, God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So first he gives an answer for Moses, I am that I am. Then an answer for Israel, I am. And then a summary answer, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of the fathers. That's who you tell them. Now, there's been a ton of ink spilled, speculating details and about the, name, the divine name of the Lord. Um, I, I was sitting in my study on Thursday with a stack of books that I was drowning in, like, Lord, God, help me. I, like, what in the world, after all these arguments and all this theological conversation, what do I give to your people? What is it you want them to know and so what I want to do is, is I want you to understand, there's so much more we could say. 
But I just want to give you a few things that I hope by the end of giving you these few things, we just end and are bursting forth with worship. I think we'll spend so much time and glory enjoying these verses in heaven. So Psalm 145, 3, great is the Lord, greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Some of these verses and this content is unsearchable. Like it's, it's, it's going to be enjoyed by God's people for all eternity. Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, 7, we've been raised with Christ so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ. So again, I just want to point out a few details, a few takeaways, and then we'll bow and worship our great God. First, the details. He says to Moses, I am who I am. Now, this is a majestic and mysterious answer. I am who I am. Aye, I share, aye, something like that. Dustin could tell me I pronounced it wrong. But it comes from the, the verb, Hebrew verb, hayah, the, the verb to be. So it's just the verb to be. So I am that I am. So what is he saying to Moses? He's saying, like, I am who I am. I am self existent. No one is like me. I am the fire that burns with no fuel. I need and depend on no one else. And I'm self-sufficient. Again, I, like there's nothing I have to go outside of myself to get in order to keep myself myself. <laughs> I'm self-existent. I am who I am. I'm the only person who doesn't identify themselves in reference to someone or something else. Like I define myself within myself and I only need myself. I'm self-existent and self-sufficient. I need no one. I depend on no one. One uh, scholar says God's name reveals that his being is very different from that of other persons. When a human being says, I am, he qualifies it with a predicate, often with some relationship to other people that defines his status or role. In the Bible, a person's identity is defined genealogically as the descendant of certain ancestors, such as Saul, the son of Kish. However, God simply said, I am, asserting that though he has relationships, he's not defined by any relationship outside of his own being, but exists of himself. God is thus the sovereign Lord. This is what theologians call God's aseity. His aseity. He's totally self-contained and has everything he needs in and of himself. So he's saying, Moses, I am who I am. I was who I was. I will be who I will be. No one, no thing can alter or change me or my plans or my power in any way, shape, or form. I'm immutable. I'm unchangeable. I am who I am, Moses. Tell Israel that. <laughs> tell them I am sent you. And say to them, notice he substitutes uh, what probably in your, in your text is uh, capital, uh, lowercase uh, O-R-D, capital, all caps, Lord. He substitutes Lord where I am was. In the previous, he says, I am, and it goes on, and now he says, the Lord. <clears throat> and he connects his covenant promises. Verse 15, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, all caps, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am be to remember throughout all generations. Now, the Lord is a translation of the Hebrew letters Y-H-W-H. It occurs more than 7,000 times in the Old Testament. Now, what you need to know is years later, uh, Jews, in, in kind of a reverent superstition, decided we're not going to pronounce that, that divine name, Yahweh. We're not going to pronounce that. So we don't want to pronounce it out of superstitious reverence, so we're going to change it to Adonai, which means Lord. Then the, the, Greek New Test, or the, the Greek Old Testament, which is what the early church would have had as their first Bible. So the, uh, the Old Testament gets translated to Greek. It's called the Septuagint. That's what the early church would have had. Is they're reading the scriptures. They're reading the Greek Septuagint. And that then was as translated kurios, meaning Lord. And in this, so we, we're understanding, we're seeing that Yahweh, this word now has been translated. So you might hear Adonai. There's other translation arguments. You might have heard Jehovah. Um, yeah, w -H, uh, y -H -W -H, Y-H-W-H, Yahweh. That's the word. That's, that's what's being uh, said. But the thing you need to understand and know about this word is it has the, the same stem as what was just came, I am, to be. So this summary statement, now what he's doing is I want you to understand, I am who I am. Tell them I am sent you. I am Yahweh. You can call me Yahweh. I'm the God of the fathers. I'm the covenant-keeping God. I'm this divine name. This divine name is the one who is, and I need no one else to comment on who I am. And matter of fact, if you want to know what my name means, just watch the next 37 chapters. Because I'm about to reveal what this name means as I unveil my power in history and crush my enemies starting with Pharaoh and Egypt. I am. That's who sent you. And tell them, if they want to know who I am, they want to know what that means, just watch and see. So know that God is holy. You should tremble. 
God is faithful, you should pray. God is with us, you should trust him. And then God is, you should bow and worship his holy name. He is. Eternal glory should go to him from all generations and generations and generations and generations. And generations later, the Lord Jesus was having a conversation with the Pharisees. They were arguing with him. He didn't like some of what he was saying. And then you need to see what he said. John 8, and this is where we'll close. The Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It's my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him, I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I'd be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. Uh Uh-oh. He saw and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you're not 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Am. Ego a me in Greek. The Greek Septuagint translates Exodus 3:14, I am that I am, ego a me. So when Jesus makes this statement, before Abraham was, not I was, so he's not just saying I'm eternal. I was hanging out before he was hanging out. Before Abraham was, ego a me, I am. And they understand in that moment, you just claim to be Yahweh. You just claim to be God. They wanted to stone him and kill him. (laughs) Friends, this God, this great God who is holy, you better be careful, who is faithful, who keeps his promise, who's kind and compassionate, who's with us, came to us in the person and work of his son, the Lord Jesus. And then John sets his whole gospel up around with the I am's. So before you get too excited about Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, be excited about that. Just don't skip over the I am. Don't miss ego and me. Don't miss to understand what he's he's letting you know. No, I am the faithful God of the Bible. I need no one. I exist on my own, and yet I condescend to save sinners. What does this mean? It means Pharaoh is no rival, no equal. Egypt is no rival, no equal. The Red Sea is no rival, no equal. The Pharisees for Christ, no rival, no equal. Demons, no rival, no equal. Diseases, no rival, no equal. Rome, no rival, no equal. Your sin, no rival, no equal. Death, no rival, no equal. Satan, no rival, no equal. The great I am is with us. Let's pray.